introduce everybody and then we'll get started. On uh, your right over here is Brooks Harris with Harris Doyle Development and he they are the developer of the Altadena Ridge subdivision. This is uh, Marv Green. He is a resident of the neighborhood, the Alta Vista Drive neighborhood, which is to the west of the Altadena Valley site. This is Brian Davis, Director of Public Works at Vestavia. Um, Rainer Bowles, he is from TCU Consulting. Ken Upchurch, also from TCU Consulting, and they're hired as the pro program managers for the city for this project. Also, I want to recognize Jeff Downs, city manager. David Myers, the president of the park board, Tommy Coggin, and Ann Smythe, park board members. Um, Kimberly Cook, city council, uh, is here. Um, also, uh, on our committee is Miss Betty Shivers, who is the um, president of the Lakeland Trail Neighborhood Association, the association over there near the dam. Um, she's on our committee and she texted Jeff and a little while ago and said she had a family emergency and was not going to be able to make it. We also have um, Randy Haddock from the Copper River Society who is on our committee. He couldn't be there, but I want to recognize Peggy Gargis from the Alabama River Keepers. Um, Beth Stewart from the Copper River Society was at our first meeting in Randy's absence and we asked Beth to invite the river keepers and um, uh, Ms. Gargas is here and uh, had some uh, a short presentation that she wanted to show that at some point during the meeting um, will show and I hope yes Kimberly. Um, Randy Hack is here. Oh hey Randy how are you? All right we hadn't met yet thank you for being here Randy appreciate it. Um, and I, I hope I have um, not forgotten anybody, but again, thanks to everybody for being here, and I want to turn it over to TCU. Great turnout. Um, we're looking forward to going through this. The main objective today is to dream big. You're going to see a list of topics that are projected on the screen, and this is just a starting point. We're here today to add to that, to talk about that, and discuss more. We want to do that over the course of the next, uh, you know, until about 8.15 or so. Um, like I said, a list of topics. You know, we try to break them down into you know pretty basic categories. Uh, we've got a special site in Old Altadena Country Club, and we just want to make sure that we can develop it in the best way for everyone in this community. And um, and we're just going to have an open discussion about that. Uh, any points that anyone has, we want to hear it. We're as good as the data that we get. So let's talk about it. All right. Would you like to? Andy, would you come up and start our presentation for her? And if you guys would like hard copies, or you may not. We, we have a thumb drive. Okay. So, yeah. you have some other people in the audience may wish to have those. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to know anything to in order to change to the next slide? Um, they uh, instruct me to uh, just advance by hitting the brown arrow right there, but don't move this because the connection is a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a strange magnetic field, so I'll try to get them on. I want to thank the uh, committee for one thing and city officials and all of those who have worked so hard and for your attention and uh, to citizens' concerns and desires for quality community spaces in Vestavia. As board president for Cahaba Riverkeeper, a Vestavia citizen and a former resident of Altadena, uh, I am here to ask you one particular thing, which is to help reduce flooding in the area by preserving the former golf course or a nature trail or passive park in those areas that ball fields are proposed for and I sincerely believe that is done. We will accomplish flood mitigation and we can find a compromise for the location of the ball fields. So regarding uh, slide one, the reason I included it, because you can find several definitions of impervious cover or impervious surface, but if you look at the bottom one, it says impervious surface refers to all hard surfaces like paved roads, parking lots, roofs, and even highly compacted soils like sports fields. And the first uh, definition tells you that basically impervious cover is anything that 
rainfall cannot filter through slowly and make its way to the stream and settle out naturally at a slow pace so that we don't have this flashing. Of, I really should be getting Dr. Haddock to do this presentation because I've heard this from him so many times over the years. He's doing great. <laughs> it, it's a tribute to Dr. Haddock and the Copper River Society that they can make a liberal arts graduate like me and a non-science person understand the concept of impervious code. But I will move to the second one. And so speaking of flooding, those of you who are familiar with the area know full well how often and how severely the force has flooded over the years. This one, this slide is from uh, James Spann, and it was taken after an April uh, 2014 flood. And what you see is the whole force is mudded over. And I don't believe Kathy Hasty is here, but I believe she told me that three months she's later, she's uh, uh, was it three months later? This four, this did this yeah, happened was previous years back, but it did this, and okay. three months later, that had just cleaned up, and it, it did it again. Okay. Um, so that's the aftermath of one of those floods. And to slide three, not to get too geeky on you because I'm not a science person. But there's uh, there are several leading experts in the, in the area of impervious cover, and um, this comes from one of the scientific articles that I found very interesting. And it shows you the difference between how rainfall evaporates and runs off, infiltrates into the ground, and uh, you know how it's treated in natural, undeveloped state. There's only 10% runoff. That's normal. That's that's acceptable and you can live with that. In a densely developed or almost totally impervious, impervious cover, there's only 10% infiltration, only 5% deep infiltration, which recharges the groundwater. We need that to be in storage for when we have droughts. But there's 55% runoff, and that's not sustainable. So as we get to just one more slide, of Alpadina flooding. Uh, this is right behind Kathy's house. This is, I think it's 2015, this is right here, Kathy. Okay. Um, this, in this flood, I you know you've got some flooding when you can cry out across the way. So, I just raised those, to show you those. You know, I just show you those to, to let you know that there are many, many more instances of flooding that we all know about from living in the area, having friends in the area, and having friends who were members of the former golf course in the U.S. too. And I saw a car washed from the spillway into the middle of the golf course one time after the one was flooded. So it's not that we hate ball fields. We just think there's bound to be a better place for them. And this is a perfect opportunity for the city to take property that could be enhanced for a nature trail, a passive park, or something that would work kindly with nature and to our pocket folks because flooding costs us money in terms of flood mitigation and water filtration. So I thank you for your Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There is, there is one other person I know who's going to. I know I'm going to get to introduce somebody. Brian Rushing is here. He's with the University of Alabama Office of Economic Development. And they are um, developing the Cahaba Blue Wave Program, which is a series of stops from Trustville or North Trustville all the way down to Selma along the Cahaba River, um, where um, people uh, can uh, enjoy the river and put in at canoe launches and they're um, trying to assist in that type of development in a responsible manner and also to um, help people understand they can put in here and the float trip would be X number of hours or minutes and if they get out here, here's a place to eat, here's a place to go to the restroom, things of that nature with signage and trails and, and that type of stuff. And we met with Mr. Rushing last week at the site and, um, and walked the site and, and discussed some of those issues. So. You know the the uh, city has an interest in working with um, the Colorado Blue program if, if that's possible at the site. Um, and, and before we want to open up open it up for discussion, I, I would like to 
Um, for those of you who don't know, I know a lot of the neighbors know the history, but for those of you who don't know the history, um, the, the uh, preliminary plan you have seen is just that. It's a preliminary plan about what could be there. No decisions have been made. Um, ultimately, the city council will decide what goes there, and it's this subcommittee's um, job to study the issue further, look at it, and for the Community Spaces Planning Committee and TCU to make recommendations to the city council so the city council can, can make an informed decision. Um, I know a lot of people here are concerned about ball fields, and so what is happening right now is the the Stavey Hills Park and Rec Board is considering uh, whether fields are necessary at this site. Um, the hope from most people is that uh, even the people up here in the park board is that this site can be enjoyed as a passive park. It is a gorgeous piece of property and I know a lot of people would like to see that. And the hope, and personally my hope, is that with the fields at Old Berry coming online and um, additional use of some of the school facilities and fields and um, uh, things of that nature and additional use of some of the Liberty Park fields that we won't have to have ball fields at this site. But we're waiting on a recommendation from the Park and Rec Board right now. They're looking at the issue and they're trying to determine whether fields are necessary at this site or when it, whether it can remain a passive park. Um, on that issue, um, you saw the picture of the flooding um, the city has done its due diligence on that issue. Um, this site is in the same floodplain as the Hoover, uh, is it the Hoover East Hoover Park? Park? The Hoover East Park, um, a mile and a half, two miles down the river, they used that site adjacent to the river for fields. What happens is the fields, when the fields flood like that, it takes um, a few days for the water to subside and dry out. And based on the, the work that the Goodwin Mills and Cablewood did two, three, four years ago when the site was assessed and the city looked at the site was that you lose, you know, 8, 10, 12 days a year over and above what normal grass, playing fields, ball fields would, would lose because of the weather, because of the time you have to wait for the, for the um, water to subside. That being said, personally, again, I think it's a gorgeous piece of property. I would love for the city um, to be able to use it as a passive park. Um, I think that we need it in the city. Um, and uh, but but let's let's try to focus on the benefits of having it as a, having it as a passive park because the due diligence has already been done about whether it is possible to use it as ball fields. And you know, Hoover East uses it for ball fields, and the golf course used it for four years um, for people to play golf. On. But again, um, I think most of the people on this com this subcommittee would like to see it as a passive park if that's possible. And the park board is going to make some recommendations to us on that issue. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, my name is Ken Up Church. Uh, my partner and I have TCU consultant. Uh, when we interviewed for this engagement, we felt like that, that by coming from the outside, we were coming in with an unfiltered voice. We don't have all the politics and the history that goes along with, with not only this particular subgroup, but with all of the subgroups. Uh, we're conducting somewhere in the neighborhood of 27 meetings in 45 days. Uh, and it's our job to listen, not to drive conversation, not to prematurely make recommendations but to listen and take all of that information and put it into some sort of format that we can present to the city and to the city council uh, with priorities, with costs. Uh, you've had a community spaces planned up. Uh, it's the basis. That's what uh, uh, some of the early drawing work, as like Tommy said, that was just very preliminary. So, so what we want to do in these meetings, particularly tonight, is to listen. Now, I've been handed a list of questions that I, I just want to put in. We're, we're videotaping these uh, meetings, uh, both audio and video, and they'll be on the website, so there won't be any question about what was said and what wasn't said and those sort of things. And Ms. Cook won't have to spend her Fourth of July holiday <laughs> editing meeting minutes. But thank you for the great work. We appreciate that. Uh, 
but uh, I want to read these few questions into the record so that, that they're there. They're from Mr. Robert Dubais, I think is the way you say that. Good <laughs> um, Some of these I can answer, some of them I can't, uh, but we will be looking at all of these. Uh, what does the Cahaba River Keeper think of the plan? And were they included in the decision process at any point? And if so, what was their role? Well, first of all, there has been no decision process yet. We're in the information gathering process. I know that Jeff has met with the uh, river keeper. And I know that uh, while he is not on this subcommittee, he is uh, invited to every meeting, and they're all public meetings. And so uh, I understand that he's maybe in school tonight, and why he's not here tonight, but that uh, clearly he'll have the opportunity to watch this video and, and, and uh, put any information he would like to in our hands. Uh, the Freshwater Land Trust has adjacent land. Has the committee considered recommending that Best Avenue Hills need or create a conservation agreement through them to preserve a buffer between the park and the Cahaba River? I would say to that, I'm not sure what communication has been had. But I will say that all uh, uh, consideration is being given to any option. That's part of our job is to put the, the what if questions before the group. And so I, I appreciate these questions. Uh, how much engineering work has been done? Virtually none. There's been some preliminary study done just to see if, if parking lots would fit and fields would fit, that sort of stuff. But, but as far as true engineering work, I don't think that's been done uh, yet. Just a hydrology study. Yeah. We did some core drilling as well. Uh, what design has been done beyond the picture in the master plan? None. It's just open to discussion. What is the current cost estimate based on? Uh, on the Altadena Park, I don't think that there was really a cost estimate done. There were some uh, educated guesses. Uh, but, but part of our job is to take the pieces that, that rise to the top in these community meetings and then consult. Con, uh, conversations with the park board and the city council and it's our job to do some pricing information on that for consideration so we will be doing that what municipalities will be required to issue FEMA no rise certifications I think anybody that does any work in a in a floodway uh, has to has to apply for that so uh, the current design is baseball fields in a floodway how would a backstop follow engineering best practices with the fence I'm not sure I really understand the question, but uh, I would defer that as, as we move forward in this. Has the Altadena Lake Dam been inspected? It's my understanding that that's a private uh, homeowner's owned deal, so I don't think the city, the city has done any inspection or they plan to. I think that's strictly the homeowners. Uh, commercial properties are planned along Hackton Road on the other side of the ridge and to the west. How will these properties manage stormwater as the in consideration of the current plan. You know, those, that will be up between the uh, approving authorities, the developers, etc. We don't have any of that information right now. What does Jefferson County, Shelby County, and the city of Hoover think of these plans? Have they been involved? I think they've probably seen it. And how much conversation has been had between Jeff and his counterparts? I'm sure there's been some. Uh, but at this point, uh, I think that's a little premature because there really are no part of plans. This is a learning experience. It's an information gathering experience, uh, a validation, if you will, of some of the assumptions that were made. Uh, and, and we've already heard some what ifs. That what if we do it this way? And uh, so it's our job to gather that information. Um, so that's that list. I believe it's Burrell. 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 Uh, Mr. Burrell has, has some questions, and I've, in the spirit of time, I hope you can go through them very quickly because we may or may not get an answer. Okay, thanks, sir. Well, first, in the spirit of it, truth and maybe, I voted for this application of uh, rezoning this for the city as a member of the Planning Zone Commission. I thought it was a deal we just could not pass up. Too much good land. But at the time, we considered it as a passive project. There were some drawings that were shown to us just as a conceptual plan that presented them. That included the ball fields, but when we asked about them, because that was not our area, our area was a zone. And we asked about these ball fields, and they said, well, that's a conceptual plan that may or may not happen. And if it happens, they would talk about a special underground, underfield, 
strange. And the more I thought about it, I talked to a couple of people about it, and they said that it looked like it was supposed to be able to handle, you know, a six to ten inch rainfall on a problem. What about a six to ten foot rainfall in a situation? I really don't know where I could justify the expense of that kind of system for what was told to us to be practice fields. And recently I've heard that they may be considering competitive fields. No stands, no lights, no provision for that. Competitive fields? I don't think so. The other thing that I've been concerned about, of course, is traffic on Acton Road. Not the volume of traffic. I've had that pointed out to me that volume isn't all that bad most of the time. The dangerous curves. I've, you've seen some, I don't know how many of you have been looking at the uh, social media that we do. But uh, if you had, you would have found out that uh, I've had over 2,000 hits on some of these things that we posted. And on another one, I had 1,900 hits. These are things where we were showing accidents on that road. And that is one of those uh, joint jurisdiction roads, I believe, isn't it, Jeff? Which means it's a nightmare to try to come up with any kind of solution to it. And there's one road in particular, one curve, the uh, residents in the area call it Suicide Curve. And it's earned. Now, one of the things that was mentioned to us originally was that it was practice fields. Is that conceivable to even be used as competitive fields? I don't, I don't know. I don't know where um, people have heard that they're going to become competitive fields because the, dis right. the discussion. Okay, that's been raised. That's why it's up there on the list. The discussion has always been that if there are ball fields there, and again, y'all y'all heard the statement at the beginning. I think most most of this committee would love to see this as a passive part. But if there are ball fields there, the discussion was specifically that they they probably couldn't be competition fields. Okay, then moving on to that, we've also heard the concept of uh, miracle fields in some of the areas that have been done. This is for handicapped people. That's right. And I wonder if this might be an area where we could put in miracle fields. It's I don't know. So That's one thing. You might have to address the field issue as, as a whole. Okay. Uh, okay. There, there are, one of the things that we're doing in all of these community meetings is gathering the data so that the data drives the equations. You have rectangular fields for soccer, football, those sort of things. And you have ball fields for softball, baseball, youth, youth sports, and sports. We've been told numerous things, but since we don't know, we have to go back and gather the data to determine whether or not you have a five field shortage on your rectangular, or four, or three, or none. Or the same thing goes with baseball. I think it's very premature to talk about the number of fields and the type of fields at any location. And I think that, that the turnout of this room has, has shown the park, and park board and, and everybody else the, the passion that goes along with this. And so I, I think you ought to take a deep breath on the fields right now until the, the data comes out because I'm, I'm not convinced that at least in the near term there's any need for fields out there. Well, this is the kind of thing we were hoping for. But we would feel better if the word no was used to it. And they can't do that. Yeah. We can't do that. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, of course, I asked about the estimated cost for the entire project, and that's the ballpark. Nobody knows yet. Nobody knows. Yeah, so we're talking about a significant amount of money. The Gold's Gym part is already chewed up a significant amount of money. The idea that there's a big bucket that you can keep dipping into is kind of scary. Well, first of all, I think there is. And, and second, our job is to take the dollars that are available as proposed, as I, as I understand, they're not even really available at this point. That we don't know about the city camp. Right. And, and allocate dollars to each and everything that shows up anywhere in any of these discussions that has some, some uh, uh, synergy to it. Okay. And then let the council do what they wish. And I've heard you answer some of my other questions, so I'll skip ahead. We'll bit save it some time. Uh, has an ADM formal environmental impact study been made on this property yet? I don't know. Will there be one made? I'm sure there would we'll have to be some sort of studies done if we're going to do some development out there. And you've already uh, talked about meeting with the Powell River Keepers, so that's on my list. 
And have you met with the residents of the neighborhood that are not residents of Best Decker Hills? Well, I think the answer to that question is yes. I think we have. Uh, yeah, Ms. Shivers is on is on the subcommittee, okay. and, and she she represents um, that neighborhood over there near the dam. Okay. We haven't met with residents other than Ms. Shivers, but that's what these meetings are for because we're here to listen to everybody who wants to speak on the subject. That's what I'm hoping that they will do. And have you uh, talked about the impact of these playing fields on Acton Road? Have you discussed that yet? We've had a lot of discussion about the entire Acton Road issue. Yeah. There's also discussion about another entrance into this area. Uh, there's been studies done on it. There's been plans developed on it. And I believe the council the access to those funds for that. Her it's, it's it's sitting on the shelf because it's too, too premature at this point to know whether that's really needed. To be and on I believe one of the component, one of the people in that didn't get it passed away. Didn't one of the people involved in that negotiation pass away? The the owner of the adjacent property in Hoover uh, passed away. Okay, so that's still up in the air. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, I asked this earlier just as a reason. The current city council ran on a basis of open communication. That was a big thing that they really, every campaign issue you went to. And I asked, has anybody here been following the social media comments? Because people are a lot more comfortable talking on social media, and they are. So I'm gonna speak to. I'm gonna speak for myself. Okay. My children try to get me on social media. I don't do it, and they're mad at me about it. I did see some uh, uh, screenshots uh, that were provided to me about the social media piece. Uh, Rainer's a lot younger. Andy and Kevin are, are a lot more. There's something that we as a group, and I'm not a spring chicken, I'm a pasture process. Uh, we as a group do use social media to pass along ideas and to gather information. It's not just a, a if a hard expression that you want to say. I've never can, can I chime in on yes, that for a second? Good. Um, one of the things that um, I've talked to Jeff about is using our Vestavia Hills Glistens portal, which is a social media type um, platform um, to drive the conversation there so that it's all in one place. And we're developing, um, out of these meetings will come some topics that will be put out there. That way people will know where to go if they want to talk about this topic and they can you know, sign in, debate, um, that sort of thing. Well, that's something that's moving in a positive direction then because it hasn't been that long ago when uh, the city totally rejected, in essence, public involvement and got an apartment complex over in Cowboy Heights. Well, I can't do anything about the history, but I can assure you that we've been told very, very plainly that these are going to be open meetings, that will be very transparent, and, and, and we're here to listen. Okay, and then my last points on it, don't put ball bills there. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need social media, don't say that. Right <laughs> okay. Anyone else have a have a list that, that they want to get into the record so that uh, uh, with that? Well, if not, yeah. Yes, sir. I sort of represent some of those residents along that ridge, uh, but farther in from the development that's going on. It's closer to the housing. Mm -hmm. So they've asked me, I guess, to speak to them. There's, there's a few questions that have been uh, they will I'll just read them all. Great. Yes, sir. Uh, one of them. They build up the western entrance road five to eight feet, along with the parking lots and roads and fields, which we just addressed a little bit more time. How will this elevation affect the neighborhood and the river? How many tons of dirt will this use? And it, it, it will be substantial if it covers the entire end of the park. So what they're saying is at the end of the ridge where it dips down is a there's a daycare center, a B E K on the big part of the ridge adjacent to it. And that area is major drainage currently for everything off coming off the back of the road. I think there's a big concern about how if, if that's going to be a second access point, there's going to be a lot of engineering issues that need to be addressed. People need to hear about them. If there's going to be substantial blasting, for example, the people that own homes there are going to be concerned about the effects that some of that may have. 
Uh, another point, what type of park rules, security, for example, will be implemented at closing times, etc., if passive or uh, baseball fields and football fields? Uh, again, this issue of blasting, how much blasting will be required if there is going to be an interest along that western area? And is the weather area going to be untouched? So there's an area, uh, the flood is obviously not, we're talking about a wetland, it's a natural constant wetland uh, at the base of that ridge, pretty much between the ridge and the open uh, fields of golf, field golf course. And that wetland is like, will there be a, a plan to put it in culverts or just leave it as a, a natural wetland? That's a big concern. The, the desire is to leave the wetland uh, as is. And so the, the short the residents along the ridge to leave that as a barrier or a buffer or whatever it might be, but not to build culverts and drainage along those in the backyards. So the short answer to your question is, I know the plans have been developed. Yes. I know that they're ready to be bid so they're complete and would have passed all of the uh, regulatory reviews. We have not reviewed. Uh, we will for the, the time uh, to, to make our final report happens. Uh, but right now that is not very high on the uh, priority list because it is a very expensive project and the city as you know has a lot of needs uh, relative to the community space. And I have this point that I haven't discussed with my comrades here yet. I don't know how they're going to receive this one, but it's dangerous. I'm a scientist and educator, and I know that the, the need for ballparks is for the youth of the city of Best Day, but I haven't heard anything with regard to the type of education experiences that might be able, this might be used for a science center or a, a recreation center, an ecology center, something along these lines where we could arrange field trips for the students in the elementary or the middle school or the high school and so forth. But to have something like, I think that Oak Mountain State Park has a center like this available with maybe a lecture center or whatever might be there. And, but I'm not familiar with the best day of the high school system or the, the school system at all in the state they build. So we something like that is something that would be, I think, advantageous for the, if you're bringing the youth of the city, then there's a place I don't think exists anywhere in the city of Birmingham that I don't think Mount Brook, Hoover, or anybody has anything like this. And it could be a first class type of education center using the Cobb River as your centerpiece, because this is a unique river in the world for that so, so we've heard some of those suggestions, and some of them are up there. We've heard stuff like increasing the size of a little small pond there and making it a, a, a fishing yeah. uh, venue, and, but also the but you can do like the water. You can do uh, ecology studies, you can do archaeology. This is a major archaeological site, actually, with Indians. If you dig along some of these areas, you can go with arrowheads and things. Okay, so something fun for the students, something fun for the kids. There's a lot of opportunity, I think, yeah. for something a world class site of education experience and center. It's right, right here on this side. And you could be setting an example, not just for the city of Birmingham, but pretty much the country. So some of you might have been here for the first meeting, which was the, the Gold's Gym, and uh, Andy Bernard with our team said, dream big. There's nothing that's off the table right now, so dream big. So those are exactly the kind of comments that, that we're trying to gather. Right now we're sitting here hacking away just as quick as you were talking. So, <laughs> yes, sir. My name is Mark Smith. I live at the community of that uh, all the business circle. And the area that was a question there, a couple concerns that I had. And we, we get to witness firsthand in that area how often it does flood. Um, you know, it's flooded really well at least three times. And I can attest, um, my wife and I, we moved there in 2011. And I witnessed a jet ski on the golf course back in 20 some years ago. <laughs> so um, that area just, it would be a challenge for any, any thought of any type of ball trip. Um, first thing is walking trails. I also get to witness first people use that walking trail all the time around there. Uh, biking trails, kids and family coming from the neighborhood over. Uh, I think green space is the most logical use of that space. Uh, maintain that as a walking trail. Maintain the beauty of that area. And something else that Railroad Park, I think, maybe something to consider is what about a community garden on one part of the park? Uh, something that can be utilized um, and also can be used in an education standpoint. Uh, these are things that I think we should look at. Things, passive things that's not going to wash away. Uh, disc golf. Um, enjoying the Cahaba River. 
uh, incorporating that. And I reiterate again, I know this is down the road, but the infrastructure and bringing in that system is going to require some engineering um, and some build up there. And I think it would destroy the natural habitat, especially the wetlands of that area. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Jordan Hunstetler, I live across the valley from uh, the new development on the other side of the Lakeland Trail. Uh, share property line with the uh, whatever park, whatever the, the finished park is going to be. Um, I've heard um, my just how I'm reading this is that uh, you've got a, maybe a pot of money to spend, maybe not. Uh, a lot of things that you'd like to do, wall park, golf gym, some things that maybe are high priority. Um, I know that at some point funds were appropriated for a lesser entrance, which has not happened. I can't help but wonder, I mean, if there aren't ballparks, if it's not going to be as many cars or ball fields going through there as you're thinking, what, and western entrance hasn't happened, what is plan B on accessing the park? That's a great question, and, and I don't think we have the answer to that right now. But we're just getting into all of this uh, information gathering piece, and, and obviously we've heard from Ms. Shivers and, and their interest of, of keeping the cars coming. She, number one, don't open the damn bag. Yeah, that's uh, number one. Number two, uh, find some way for the cars not to get on the road and, and park and, and wander in there. Uh, some of those sort of things, uh, size of any entrance on, on that end of the site. Uh, so there's all of those sort of things that are percolating right now in the, in the uh, information gathering phase. So we've heard the need for for access into the park, but we also don't want to have lights that are on all night that light up the parking lot, or we want the parking lot to be landscaped and hidden and nice, and to be able to control those access points so that. You know, there's no loitering going on. Those are all priorities that we've heard, and we need comments like that, community gardens, teaching centers, to hear more of that. That's what we want to hear. And you can see, you know, this column number one talks about that. A parking and access that's got adequate signage, proper flow, and, and, and is clean and controlled. And these are the comments, those perfect kind of stuff that we want to hear to be able to give the access to the community that we need. Well, one of the recommendations that you may be an access point. Right. Yes. So right. What exactly. the options would be Western entrance. Could be. Would be currently somewhere in, in, in the area of the dam blocked off. Not only in the dam. We've, we've heard that pretty clear. Control control uh, hours of use. Uh, Other side of Lake Lunker? I don't know. Haven't discussed it. I, I don't know. You talk about on, on your side of yes. the trail. We we have not discussed that at all. That has not ever come up. Don't discuss that. So. <laughs> <laughs> you just did. Yeah. You yeah. got to put that down. You just put it in our mind. You just put it in our mind. We're talking about my side. Yeah. That that has not that has yeah. not come up. Um, you mentioned that you guys uh, walk the the river. I'm I'm sorry with the uh, Mr. Rushing, rushing. Um, about a uh, canoe access point. Is yeah. there anywhere that struck you as a, a great location for a canoe access point? Um, we took just a very cursory look that day. The, the river was up, mm -hmm. surprisingly. Um, <laughs> we're going to have to take a closer look, really, at, at the river, um, looking at the not only you know how an access. Um, you know, driving access and bringing your boat to the river, what that looks like, but then also the river bank conditions. Right. And, uh, and we're going to have to do that really when the water is, is lower. And uh, we're going to um, make recommendations basically to the committee um, based upon the Cahaba Blue Way uh, best practices guidelines for site development, which emphasize uh, developing accesses that are number one, safe, number two, environmentally sustainable, and number three, durable, not in order of priority, but safe, sustainable, durable is, uh, is what we're looking at. So um, so we'll make recommendations um, as to what that could look like, maybe a few different options, you know, based upon 
uh, what the, the overall site access might end up looking like. But we'll, we'll look at the, the best sites that are going to be providing the most access with the least impact and uh, in, in keeping those uh, that, that improvement in environmental sustainable. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have one more question. That whole interchange confused me a little bit. Can you stand up? Yes, sir. Uh, as far as the entrances go, the western entrance, I thought I was under the understanding that it was going to be like a secondary entrance if necessary. Is there not a primary plan that's already designed and ready for bid? You're saying you have that whole western entrance already designed, engineered, and ready for bid, but it sounds like you don't have a primary entrance designed. We've, ready we've only been involved less than 30 days. Well, somebody's got to have well, a plan. But what, I, what I was going to get to is I think, I think they have paused a lot of that expensive engineering studies until they determine what some of these uh, priorities need to be and, and where they may fall in the in the cost analysis and all of those sort of things. So think of it as that everything is still in the planning stage. There'll be some some decisions that will require further study. And and if it's a high priority and it fits within the parameters of of, of cost and the funds available because there is a limited amount. Uh, decision will have to be made whether that has an impact on, on going forward with it or not. But uh, right now everybody everything is wild. One of the issues is if there are no ball fields there is a western entrance necessary. So that's one of the issues being considered. I wish Ms. Shivers was here because she would be most affected and her neighbors who are here would be most affected if there's no western entrance entrance. So we have had discussions with her about that and what we've heard is you know, if there's no western entrance because there are no ball fields and we don't need a big entrance and a big parking lot, then, you know, what what is acceptable to the neighbors on that end of the, on that eastern side of the park? So we're having discussions with Ms. Shivers about that and we, we, we're happy to hear from anybody else who lives there as well. So currently, if it falls to just a passive park with no fields and only some residential development, there is no plan of where the entrance will be at all to any of it? We, we need to determine what amenities might be at the park to determine what type of entrance is necessary. The two options that have been considered at this point are the eastern entrance over there near the Harris Dole new development over there near Lakeland Trail and then the western entrance. Those are the only two entrances that have been discussed at this point. If there are other options, you know, then TCU and the city here need, need to consider this. The, the other thing is until there is some more definitive planning of what's going there, it's pretty hard to tell what the traffic count might be, what the size of any uh, uh, interchange needs to be, any access point, size of a parking lot, those sort of things. So it's all very much in play right now. And, and I think the fact that of all of the nine, eight sub subcommittees that are going on, this one seems to have the most passion about it. And so I think the, the time in which this needs to be studied is is now and, and the listening tour has begun. That's fine, thank you. It just seemed a little odd that you have engineering plans for a build, build out and ready for bid for one area, but nothing on well, the other. There, there was some, well, there were some other factors that, that uh, played into the timing of, of needing to do that interchange and, and that sort of thing. It, it had nothing to do with the fact that they were going to put it in and, and predetermine what was going in this park. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Reed and Johnson, Alton Lake Drive. Um, you thought we have different entrances. You know, it's something a little right by it. You know, I'm a couple doors from there. Um, this whole talk about having an entrance right by the dip, right by the front entrance of the development. I, I'd love to fight that any way I can. I mean, it's absolutely it. ludicrous. I mean, the amount of traffic they're talking about, trying to get through the corner, trying to get in that entrance by the development, they're going to be cutting through Red Wing, in front of all our houses, and we're not in for the stadium. Yeah. You're going to be coming through destroying our neighborhood uh, to benefit the stadium. And, and, and I mean, I want to think that we'll talk about any discussion about even having an entrance there off the table. I don't know how I do that, but I mean, you know, I'd like to, you know, find out who we need to talk to or how we need to go about fighting this because that will absolutely destroy us. Well, <coughs> and then, you just I'm, talking about, I'm talking about danger, I'm talking about the traffic, I'm talking about market value homes, I'm talking about uh, 
Um, you know, people are trying to park in the streets mm-hmm. right there. They're already parked in the right. streets. We saw that. We saw that. You know, and, and so you know, take you know, talk about taking the western entrance off the table. I mean, that's the only place I want. It. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm for the park. I love the idea. I love the idea of the passenger park. You know, trails. I mean, look what Spain. Look, the Hoover's got Spain Park. They're killing it. The people that are there, the traffic, the people, the usage, and all that. The trail. People go up from all over the place and use it. I think that'd be a wonderful thing for the state. Easy to keep up. You know, I, I, I've seen it flood so many times there myself that you know I can't imagine having a any type of structure. You know, I, I think it's a great idea. I'd love to have it, but I just can't see that being viable. Well, you just so my, my, my flight, my flight's over the entrance right now. Okay, great. You know, I, I, I bring that up. Or thank thank you for coming, because that's what you did. You, you've done the right thing. Thank you. Oh, right, done. Thank you. But, but, and also, those people, most of those people in the neighborhood wanted to go into that stadium. And that was all tabled. And so we're sitting there. There's people who have little children who are, don't know whether to put their houses up. You know, because they moved there being told it was going to go to Estadia. And then when they talk about probably maybe not allowing those few houses, which are not many houses, the, the age of the, the population there is still very elderly. Uh, so it's not a lot of children, but I know the school issue as well. But um, that's another issue. That's not even really their part, and yet you're, they're talking about the neighborhood there and the house next door and three houses up, they're not even in this area. Right. And I walk every day at Spain Park and that, even though you say if it's not ball fields, there won't be a lot of traffic, that place, I mean, it's wonderful. I love it. I use it. But you can't get a parking place there. And people park up in the grass there. And, you know, there's wonderful events there. And I'm sure this area can hold wonderful things at, at that place, too. Um, but parking will, it will bring a lot of traffic. I don't care if it is a passive park, which would be fabulous, and I'd love to see a playground and all that. There's a definite need. That's not so passive. It's what? Playground equipment, that's not so passive. Uh, really. That's not passive. Even that's not passive. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not really. Uh, well, our, big, our big thing is really having an entrance right there. Gotcha. I mean, you know, it's going to be busy. It's going to be used as busy. It People will, love it. There'll be parking house down our street. They were the, the other day when we were out there. We saw it. All in front of my house. On the side of my house. Yeah. Is the main consideration against the west entrance for the money? The cost? I, I don't know if they, I mean, Jeff, you might want to answer that, but it's my understanding that we qualified to say that. My understanding is the main objective with the western entrance is right now they don't have enough information to make a, a firm decision. But there were there were factors involved in, in needing to proceed with it because of purchases and side agreements and those sort of things. I think and and so it was always part of the process, but it was just a piece of the puzzle. It's not. The end all, it's not off the table, it's not on the table, it's just sitting out there until the determination is made is what could go out there and what impact it will have from a pedestrian and traffic and those sort of things. So, well, you're, you're adding 70 houses to our streets, you know, in and out of there. I'm I, I not sure. I thought I thought you had you. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I, 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 I feel you, that's fine, and I can assure you that everybody on our team feels the best. And that'll be a part of our report. Yes, ma'am. The Western entrance, I know, you know, the people at Lakeland want it there. Can you stand up, please? Um, the Western entrance, there's going to be a lot of blasting when they do that. It also floods a lot on that end. So the cost of building that Western entrance has is, is got to be astronomical. Well, as I said earlier, we know about it. We know where, where it stands right now. We have not studied it yet. We try to get to have to elevate it, and then that's going to, you know, affect the houses that are all right there, and now it's going as well. So, I mean, they had said that we're going to have to raise the five to eight feet, I believe, is what the number goes on here. So that's a lot. We're looking at it. I mean, that's, that's a lot of elevation. Yes, ma'am. I'm saying. Who else? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to know how anxious the city of Estavia is to pull this plan together? Are we 
talking about three years from now? We're talking about next year? Well, I will tell you what our schedule is. Uh, our engagement for phase one is 90 days. We're to report back to the city council in mid September. Uh, our engagement ends at that point unless the city council takes some sort of action, whatever that action may be. Um, uh, the second phase would be the design and, and bidding phase of any of the amenities that would go along with the new plan. That's estimated to be somewhere between six and 12 months. And how long the city council would hold it from mid-September until they made a decision. You know, that's just internal. Uh, and then the implementation stage, the actual construction stage, would start after that six to, to twelve months period. So you're 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 always at, and uh, there's still a lot of conversation to be had. And uh, you know, frankly, we weren't sure how many people were going to turn out to these meetings, uh, but we were very pleased with, with the turnout tonight for both of the meetings. Uh, and we've got two more tomorrow night, a couple on Thursday. You know, it's it's aggressive to get twenty something meetings in forty five days. The holidays, those sort of things. Yes, ma'am. I hate to double dip, but can somebody tell me how much has been spent so far on the western entrance? I don't have a clue. Engineering work, engineering work of uh, about twenty-five thousand uh, dollars preliminary right now, and uh, what it would purchase price of the land was. So the purchase price that's already been paid. The land has already been bought. So the city owns it. City owns the land. Yeah, I know. How much was that purchase? Uh, Four hundred thousand dollars or so. Okay. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I don't have a question, but more of a statement. Okay. Um, I don't live by the park. I live in Liberty Park. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you guys heard from somebody else a different perspective. We, um, I have a teenager who he and his friends have me drive them, well, not this past couple of weeks because we can't go to the river right now because the cola, I won't let them go in right now. But last summer we spent all of the summer, instead of going to the pool, we went to the river, which we're using the entrance in that river right now because, well, it's closed, but it's also because it's closed. Or it's nice. I mean, so if we had something where we could do that, we have we have a canoe, but we don't have a good place to put it in. Right. Um, he's in scouts. We would love to have more scout things where we could take a bunch of canoes and, and go in there. So I'm really excited if we would be using it as a natural area. That would be really exciting to me because I know a, a good handful of kids that I would be dragging from Liberty Park every other day. So Mr. Rush, you can sit right there and he'll take, he'll take your input and, exactly. and he'll take your money and he'll take well, anything yeah. you'll give. Yeah. So I want you to know that there is there are people in the community who want this to be a natural park. We, we've so, heard that. And if y'all want to take them. a look at the, the Hawthorne River walkway that y'all brought in right on over to the road. Yes. Yes, very and it's very limited parking. I like that part. And no bathrooms. <laughs> and no bathrooms. Yes, sir. I've got one more comment about that. that for friends of the applicant side that are not residents, I know you said you don't have the history behind it. That's one thing you're working There's a bit of history I do want to give you. Okay. We have a parallel example of a city that had no regard for the residents going ahead with the plan and having results turn out badly. The city was Mountain Brook. The city that was on the bad end of it was West Heavy Hills. The street is East Street. And West Heavy and Mountain Brook went ahead with a recreation plan of playing fields fully lighted at the end of East Street. And it was a nightmare then. It's a nightmare now and it has killed their values. Mountain Brook that care. Don't put us in the position of being Mount Brook. So I would say this. Again, I'm not from Mount Brook, best day in Birmingham. Brainer lives in Birmingham. And in Kevin Little Huntsville, I live in Hungary. Uh, it's pretty clear to us 
that that not only the that's Davia Hill's staff, Jeff and his team, but Ms. Cook and her council really want to get this right and they really want to have input. There's been no attempt to stifle it. There's been no attempt to to uh, cloud our uh, fresh use of this. And, and I would suggest it's because they don't want to be a bad to their own residents or to others. And that's what I appreciate about this effort. Can I say Absolutely. <clears throat> we've talked about entrances and we've talked about runoff and impervious, uh, impervious, all these kind of things. If it was a perfect park, what would you want in this park? You know, so tell me, tell me your perfect passive park. Is it? I mean, look at the green space list here. Is it? You know, I heard some social media comments on golf and driving range. You know, practice facilities there. I heard dog parks. Um, you know, those trees out there are beautiful. We've heard priorities to maintain those pine trees are a huge deal. What are some of the fun yeses? What do you want out of your passive park for this community? Take a look at the Mountain Brook to Harbor River walkway. Take some guidance from that. Talk to the people at the Botanical Gardens who know natural, local vegetation and know what that vegetation can filter on the rainwater. That would be a start. And passive parks don't have to have, I don't mean to be but they don't have to have playground equipment. Kids can run like pipes. Like heights. Yes, right. Besides bathrooms, which for a mom going with boys, that's a requirement. <laughs> um, I, I would rather not have many structures at all. Um, Someone put a canoe in. Um, if there is a wetlands area, is, are, are there birds there? Are there um, unusual flowers that we, I mean, I grew up in another state that. I mean, I remember the woods behind my elementary school had all these new things. We would like go during recess and go up there and look at it. We have access to some really neat things in our city. Well, almost our city. In our park. I don't want to bulldoze that and not see that. I want to utilize the natural. Yeah. If we're going to use the natural area, use the natural area. Yeah, love we don't teach and learn. Well, right. then we don't Scientific. need it. Dog park. If we were going to have a dog park, or are we not having a dog park now that was a whole way Years ago, yeah. you know, yeah. if you cross Caldwell at the river, if you look, through, well, if you see the dam, you yeah. know dam. Years ago, the apartment complex there was all to create one of these past walking trails. Yeah. We went through. We labeled the trees. We had one of the we had the oldest tree in the state of Arkansas. In Alabama. Been in Arkansas, LA. The <laughs> oldest oak tree in the state was on just above that dam. So we had a series of trails and labeled trees. Since the time I think the ownership of the apartment has changed hands several times. But if you go back, I don't know if you can get back in there any longer or not, but the trails are there. Right. And you can see the kind of things you can do with just right along the river. Mm -hmm. um, and so these things have been done in the past. Been long lost and forgotten generations of one. It was when I was a kid that we did all this. So it's available still to do. Actually, I mean, kids I nowadays need it more than ever. Yeah, oh, okay. I, I Mr. Smith, these comments as well. Uh, if you add yeah. buildings, if you add fences, if you add lines, it takes away from the natural uh, beauty of the area. Uh, look at Veterans Park. Veterans Park is heavily utilized. You cannot run there without. You know, missing a dog. You cannot run that 5K course without missing a dog. There's plenty of areas to walk a dog, um, but you put a dog park there, you're going to have to put a fence there. And then you're going to have stuff washing against it, or it's going to be maintained. It's, it's going to take away from the natural assets of the area. Uh, so I agree. The natural park is the best. That's what we want to hear. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm not keeping it natural, but I'm thinking about two. First of all, I'm not even discussing ballparks. I'm forgetting about those. But <laughs> if you. Uh, if you look at McCollum Park, which we already have, and it's in a blood zone. If you look at the uh, Mount Brook uh, Park over in that area, that's right next to Creek Plus frequently. The things they have in common is that they 
keep the natural area. It's very easy to get to. There's some limited parking, but it's not fantastic parking. And there's no artificial lighting. After it gets dark, it's over. And there's something to consider on that. We heard that a lot. Yes, sir. A lot of these, what these people are saying is wonderful. And I would say keeping it minimal to restroom facilities and parking that allows people to utilize the river as a focus, natural area of walking past. And if you're going to use any kind of other activity, disc golf on the party there fairways would be good without being majorly impactful or even being expensive. I mean, keeping those things natural in the built environment minimal outside of maybe the, a good entrance that's far away from residents would keep the cost down and allow people to go out there kick a ball with their kid, play disc golf, throw, throw picks with their kid, walk around, but not be a major build-out experience. Sure. That's great. Thank you. Yes, sir. I guess uh, part of this is you're putting together a budget. I would like to this. I have about 700 feet of property line and a lot of, I mean, it, it feels like part of your property. Um, so. Are you talking about a fence that I don't know. Around all country? No, on my property. And your property? So people don't call them. So people on, from the parks will come on. That's the property. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the city can put an improvement like that on private property. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm on this, on the city's oh, okay. yeah. 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 I'm just saying you can walk from the park onto my property. I mean, you don't know that you're, you're getting off the park. Uh, 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 which also leads to the question about, you know, the park, uh, park pedestrians have an access to the lake. How do we keep them off the lake? That's a great question. You're like, no, that's a great question. Well, there's there's the golf course lake, and then there's the neighborhood lake. I'm talking about the neighborhood lake. Right, okay. Yeah, we've talked in the showers about that. Let's just put a fence all the way to the gate of the developer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's certainly, it's certainly <laughs> not there. I suspect Ryder just put it down. <laughs> <laughs> if we were going to have um, some walking trails and natural areas, and if there is going to be a wetland that will be preserved, I think having a sort of a deck, a walkway, a way for right. people to appreciate it and see yeah. it um, and experience it. Right. That's, awesome. That's very nice. And even though it's a flooded area, yeah. it frequents it, there are structures like picnic tables made out of concrete that they won't go too far. The golf park has some great picnic tables. Something just like that, where you uh, just sit down and rest, grab a quick bite, enjoy watching the kids play. Very good. And that might be good for the senior citizens, the older residents as well. Watch it, kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the older adults. Well, at the last <laughs> meeting, they were trying to come up with a new, new, new name. Older adults. Yeah. Seniors. So, uh, what else? What have we forgotten to ask you? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, Randy Haddock with the Cobb River Society. One of the things that we discussed early on was when this idea of when, when, when the purchase was made was that uh, Mrs. Gargis has kind of outlined uh, the impact and, uh, of increasing purposeness and increasing the volume and the rate of runoff. Uh, as some of the residential occurs, some of that development, it's going to increase the amount and volume and rate of runoff. We were hoping to mention this to Chris Necro at the time uh, that some of these wetland areas or a, a separate amenity could be developed that would help handle that volume problem. Right now, the Cahaba River, although I'm, I'm proud of it in terms of the biodiversity, it's impaired for excessive sedimentation and it's due to that increased volume of runoff. Right. And the more um, pavement and rooftop you have, the more volume. So helping deal with that by having uh, an infiltration pond Perhaps separate. Now don't don't use up the wetlands, yeah. <laughs> making a, that feature. Mm -hmm. But it's, it could actually be something that helps the health. We've the actually area. had some of that uh, conversation at the subcommittee level, and and I think that uh, that's a, a very good point. And, and 
Yeah, Randy, and, and Randy and I had a long conversation about that, and then uh, he couldn't be our, our informational meeting with Beth Stewart from the Colorado River Society was there, and she educated us on a lot of those issues. And um, and I can tell you that the city is committed to doing this properly and um, and and as low impact as possible. Uh, Mr. Burrell just pointed out that David Butler from the um, Cobb River Keepers is here. Thank you, thank you for being here as well. Um, and and we're here to we're here to work with you guys to make sure this is done properly and um, and preserves what needs needs to be preserved. And and we're, we're committed to doing that. So in the last five minutes, is anyone else at the committee level that wishes to have anything to say? But we've got one more question. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I just wanted to, to say how excited I am to see this level of, of, of concern, of passion for the, the, the beauty and natural uh, environment that we do have here in Vestavia that's just incredible. It is incredible. And, and especially, I mean, because I know that there are several new developments that are going to be happening along the Cahaba and other parts of Vestavia and mm -hmm. then with Park. But there's a lot that involves the Cahaba River running through Vestavia, and I hope that this trend of concern and and a real protection for it will continue. Because I hate to for Vestavia to be known as the city that you know killed, killed the Cahaba, and um, so it would be great to go the other way. Yeah, yeah. We put controlled drainage and runoff in each column because. We're outdoorsmen and sportsmen as well, and we we want to protect natural resources yeah. as much as anybody else. So, uh, in closing, thank you all for coming. Um, what is the date of the third and final meeting of this subcommittee? Andy, yeah, I want to what we what we would like for you to do is is talk this up and, and double the crowd for, for the next time. Um, what? Meeting number three will be about is that it's our intention to take, and this will be for every committee, but since you're here for this one, take everything that we've heard, begin to put it into some sort of format that that uh, we will allow you to. Uh, I'm told that the city has a software availability that uh, when we throw out a topic. You will have the ability to, with your smartphone, uh, vote yes, no, different, <laughs> without having to raise your hand and talk in front of your neighbors. And and we want to gather that data so that we have that data in which, as we begin to put our final subject, because it's not about what we want; it's what about it's what y'all want, and, and what's best for the city, not only for Altadena, but for Wall Park, for Liberty Park, and for everybody else. It's, uh, so when's the date? Uh, July 26th. Yeah, at 5.30. And we think it is in this it's world. Seven. Oh, okay. on the seven. <laughs> it says that on the... I had it at seven. Yeah. I had it at seven. Change seven. I'm Is it here? Yes. Yeah. It's in here. And if it's not, it'll be in the next room. But if y'all will double this crap, we'll have to be here. It'll be here. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your time. <laughs> uh, our, our contact information is on the website. And uh, we'll put it Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.